Good evening. My name is Samuel Nganchoga from the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. I'm making a presentation on the Indian indentured workers and the making of colonial Kenya. Kenya became a British protectorate in 1895 and thereafter a crown colony in 1920. To penetrate the protectorate, infrastructure was one of the priorities of the colonial administration. The building of the Kenya Uganda Railway that started in 1896 to 1901 depended on the important contract labor from India, popularly known as the Indian coolies. Cumulatively, 36,811 coolies, artisans, guides, and subordinate officers were recruited and signed contract for three years and more and a return passage to their place of enlistment. The coolies began to return to India after the contract ended in 1899, but about 7,000 decided to remain behind after the completion of the railway, and hence forming a significant Indian minority community in colonial Kenya and Uganda. The British colonial administration was faced with the dilemma of resettling Indian community. That led to the land question among the three racial groups, the Africans, the Indians, and the British white settlers. The so-called white highlands were designated for the white settlers and Africans were realigned to the African reserves. That left the issue of the Indian question unresolved. The Devonshire White Paper of 1923, a policy document written by the colonial secretary, Victor Cavendish, the 90th Duke of Devonshire, regarded the status of the settlers, Indians and natives in the Kenya colony broadly upheld that Kenya was an African country and that Africans' interests were paramount. In this discussion, I'm going to look at the role that the Indians therefore played in the making of colonial Kenya. The Indians came into Kenya as indentured workers, but they were very critical in the empire building uh, as we're going to see in the discussion below. It's important to understand that long before colonization, the Indian presence in East Africa was occasioned by commercial interest. Further to that, the Indian commercial enterprise was stimulated by the establishment of the British rule in India and the British naval supremacy in the Indian Ocean. Indian merchants, traders, and financiers, taking advantage of the British hegemony in the Indian Ocean, moved to the East African coast as exporters, importers, artisans, and financiers. The entry of the British colonization into East Africa in the late 19th century witnessed the increased presence of the Indian population in East Africa as soldiers and also as workers with the Imperial British East African Company. The decision by the British colonial empire in 1895 to build the British East African Railway from the East African coast to Uganda increased the demand for the Indian workers. The British colonial empire decision to build the East African Railway based on the model earlier constructed in India occasioned the demand for the Indian skilled labor. Consequently, the colonial Indian government amended its 1883 Immigration Act and allowed Indian migration to East Africa to aid in the construction of the railway under a three year contract. From 1896, labor recruiting agencies such as A.M. Chivanchi arose in Karachi, Surati, Popanda, Chamnaga, Popay, Punjab, and Calcutta, and began the process of contracting and shipping Indian laborers to East Africa. Apart from being employed in the construction of the East African Railway, the Indian recruits were hired as troops and were used in the pacification of the local African population uh, in places along the Kenyan coast, the Ogaden, as well as in the Somali coast. In 
There was also the third category of the Indian Dukawalas, all the small shop retailers who began to penetrate the interior of the British colonial empire, supplying the much needed merchandise in various retail outlets. Between 1896 and 1901, there were about 32,000 Indian coolies who had been recruited for the service of the East African Railway construction, colonial soldiers, and also in the civil service. At the end of the railway construction in 1901, nearly all the Indian coolies decided to settle in the British colonial East Africa in order to gather for the African and the European and needs along the major railway lines. We therefore see a transition of this category of the Indian endangered laborers to entrepreneurs and therefore played a very important role in the making of the early colonial economy. It is important to note that prior to the outbreak of the First World War, the white settlers were not instrumental in the colonial economic growth. The first in the, the Indian played an important part of the colonial economic growth. Their major contribution was in the establishment of the duca based enterprise throughout the protectorate. Others established, established light industries in the country. Among them were Alidina Bisram, whose commercial interest in Zanzibar spread along the East African coast. He established the soda factories, oil mills, the soap factory, cotton chinery, money and business stalls around the East Africa. He also established money lending uh, stalls from where he began to lend money and goods to both Asians and Europeans. By the outbreak of the First World War, the Indians had monetized the commercial transaction and opened the interior to commerce and trade and therefore laid the structures for the early colonial economy. The enterprise of the pioneer Indian traders, notably among them Alidina Bistram, built very extensive East African wide business networks. The pattern of commerce adopted by Bistram and other Asian traders revolved around the exchange of much needed imported goods, such as clothes, uh, glassware, uh, pottery, among others. The Indian bazaars, as they were known, uh, uh, included the development of the engineering workshops, the schools, hostels, hospitals, and these were dotted along the Kenya colony. The Indian Dukawala was widespread in colonial Kenya, uh, and therefore it played a very important role in the, in the, in the development of the early colonial economic system. Apart from the business enterprise that played a very important role in the development of the early colonial economy, we also see the entry of the Indians into the colonial civil service. In the civil service, the Europeans, of course, occupied the senior positions, where the Asians occupied the middle level positions, and Africans occupied the subordinate positions. The Indians entered the colonial civil service as clerks, accountants, teachers, doctors, and therefore they played a very important role in entrenching the colonial rule. Indian serving in the colonial civil service began to face discrimination from the Europeans, and at times they were replaced by the incoming Europeans. In responding to this, the Indians formed the Indian Civil Service Association from 1918 in order to fight and demand for better working conditions, bring to an end racial discrimination, as well as salary differentials that were seen within the early colonial civil service. The Indians were therefore instrumental in the creation of the colonial Kenya and therefore served as soldiers, railway contractors, clerks, interpreters, industrialists, traders, and food suppliers. Apart from the colonial civil service, the Indians also played a very important role, particularly in the war effort, particularly in the First World War from 1914 to 1918. 
The campaign, particularly in East Africa, which was a, a contestation between the British, the Belgians, the Portuguese on one side, and the Germans on the other side, particularly in 1914, saw a contingent of Indian expeditionary forces. Uh, some of them recruited from Rockery were therefore playing a very important role in the establishment of the British colonial empire within the East African region. What is very critical is to understand the Indian question in colonial, in colonial Kenya. The Indian question arose out of the hostile colonial environment that was opposed to the Indian presence and access to land, business, and legislative politics. The Indians were also agitating against segregated residential quarters, racial, racialized education system, and restricted migration. The colonial land policy discriminated against the Indians from accessing the white highlands. Several Crown Land Ordinances were passed from 1902 that encouraged the Europeans to migrate to East Africa, while restricting the migration of Indians to Kenya. The then Colonial Secretary, Lewis Harcourt, restricted the further migration of Indians to East Africa, as well as to the lucrative White Highlands, on the basis that the Indians were not better farmers. The colonial government regarded the Indians as non-progressive, and even when they were given land, they were given uh, um, infertile land. The subsequent colonial ordinances of 1915, 1915 also barred interracial uh, land transfer, as well as making it impossible for the, for the Indians to purchase land from the Europeans. What therefore ensued was the continuous insubordination as well as subjugation of the Indians within the colonial establishment. It is important to note from the very beginning that the Indians were very instrumental at the the at the empire at the British at the British colonial empire building, but the subsequent years uh, began to demonstrate that the British settlers, together with the colonial government, wanted to subordinate the Indians to the second level, and this for this reason, therefore, the Indians began uh, a process of political protest. What follows, therefore, is uh, the politics of representation in a in, in a Kenya colony will be seen when the colonial legislative and executive council were formed as important organs of colonial control and political expression. In 1905, these two important organs were formed and they were put under the control of the colonial governor. It therefore meant that the colonial powers were shifted to the white settlers. The legislature was subordinated to the executive council. The executive council uh, was defined to include the governor and those appointed by the Crown Colony. The governor became the president of the executive council. The governor had the veto powers. The establishment of these two organs were very important in the, in the development of the in the development of the of the white settler dominance uh, in Kenya. In a nutshell, the Indian wanted to be elected into the Legislative Council. They established the East African Indian Congress as a vehicle to represent, as a vehicle to represent the Indian interests. They demanded for racial equality, election into the Legislative Council. They also demanded for land in the White Highlands. In response, the colonial government gave the Indians limited space within Within the, within the Legislative Council. Despite these developments, the Indians felt frustrated and hence they demanded for, uh, for representation within the Legislative Council. But the Devonshire White Paper of 1923 declared that Kenya was therefore an African 
country and the interests of the Africans were paramount. What was the implication of the Devonshire White Paper on the Indian interest in Kenya? By 1923, it was now clear that the future of the Indians in Kenya was at the stake. The Indians realized that for their survival, they had to share, they had to create an alliance with the Africans. The paper, of course, it did not recommend the increase of the African representation, nor did it recommend for Africans to have a higher representation within the Legislative Council. But what was very clear from the Devonshire White Paper was that the Indian interests were at stake. Following uh, the Legislative Council Amendment Ordinance of 1924, the membership within the Legislative Council increased substantially. But then the Indian representation within the Legislative Council was very minimal. Indians therefore felt that they needed to create a political system that would allow them to uh, agitate for their demands. Consequently, the Indians formed um, political associations and began to demand for increased representation. But nevertheless, there was indeed divided, um, divided uh, interest within the Indians. There were those who were Indian Muslims and there were those who were Indian Indians. This division worked against them and therefore the British uh, uh, colonial settlers opted to work with the, with, the, with the Indian Muslims to the disadvantage of the Hindus. And therefore this affected their united front. The politics of decolonization towards the uh, 1940s also had far reaching implications on the Indians. The Mau Mau movement shifted their attention from the Indians to the Africans. Although the Indians worked very closely with the Africans against the settler dominance, the spirit of Africanization and the constitutional framework of the 1960s really worked against the Asian interest uh, within the colony. At independence, most of the Indians moved out of the colony while those who opted to remain behind uh, moved into business, laying the foundation for the Indian dominance in the post-colonial uh, economy. So this is the end of my presentation, and thank you very much for listening to me. I therefore invite uh, questions uh, after this. Thank you very much.